There are new developments and still a ton of misinformation. So on this Wednesday checkup, coronavirus episode two. Right off the bat, I have to say again, we should not be panicking. Alert, not anxious is the mindset I want you to take, just like I said in the first coronavirus video last week. There's been a ton of headlines with the WHO declaring a global health emergency, the CDC declaring a national emergency here in the United States, but all of those are not reasons to panic. I'm gonna be explaining what each of those things mean, what they mean for you, things you can do to keep yourself safe and put this whole coronavirus thing into perspective as to the way we see it now and how the situation is gonna expand and change. Today's date is February 3rd, 2020. The reason I tell you that is because the numbers are gonna change moving forward and I want you to know when this video was filmed. We're also gonna learn more about this virus. We're gonna learn how it spreads. We're gonna learn more about its genetic makeup, how it came about. So I want you to be as up to date as possible. I may make another coronavirus video for next week's Wednesday checkup, but we'll see how that situation evolves. Let's start off this episode by talking numbers. Over 20,000 individuals worldwide have been infected with this novel coronavirus. There's been 436 deaths worldwide, with the huge majority of them being in China. There's only been a single death outside of China that's been in the Philippines. In the US currently, we have 11 cases, no fatalities. Since we're talking about numbers, I thought it would be interesting to mention, there are still 60 million individuals on lockdown in China this very moment, because the Chinese government is trying to do anything and everything it can to limit the spread of this virus. Next, I thought we'd move on to the designation that the WHO released last week, saying that this is a global health emergency. And when they did this, I saw a lot of tweets come my way of people critiquing my previous video, where I said that we should be alert, not anxious, and not panic, and say, well, how are you saying this isn't a crisis if the WHO is labeling this a global health emergency? Let's explain what the WHO means when they say something's a global health emergency. Practically speaking, this is gonna open up avenues for networks of communication between clinical sites, research sites, lab sites. It's gonna unlock dollars that could be spent for these networks. On top of that, WHO is gonna be able to hold countries accountable for reporting accurate numbers so we know what's going on internationally, we can monitor the situation well. It does not mean that they labeled it a global health emergency and we should panic. In fact, it's the exact opposite. They're taking steps to prevent us from panicking by making educated decisions and unlocking much needed dollars to help combat the situation. Now moving on to the designation by the CDC of a national health emergency here in the United States. Again, this is not cause to panic. It's obviously a reason to be alert, not anxious. I'm gonna repeat that throughout the video. But the reason they're doing this is because they're taking extra precautions and steps to make sure that the virus does not find itself here in the US. Again, the huge majority of these cases, the 20,000 cases are in China. There's only 11 cases in the US and we wanna keep that number as low as possible. What is the CDC doing? Well, first and foremost, we've increased screening to 20 airports. We've also decreased the amount of flights coming from China to the US. And now if you're a foreign national, meaning that you're not a US citizen and you're not a direct relative of a US citizen, if you're from China or you've recently visited China within the last 14 days, you will not be allowed to visit the US during this time. On top of it, if you are a citizen and you're coming back from the area in China known as the Hubei province, Apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. That's the area where the virus first broke out. Wuhan is the main city there. You're gonna be held in quarantine for 14 days. So if you're coming from that city, you're coming back to the US and you're a citizen or you're a family member of a citizen here, 14 days quarantine just to make sure you don't have the virus. Because the worst thing that could happen is if you come from that area, you don't know if you have the virus yet, you go into the public, you get a little sick, you think it's a regular cold, but it's really this novel coronavirus, you can get a lot of people sick very quickly. It is quite infectious, much like the regular flu. We're gonna be talking about that in a bit. As an interesting fact, the last time we had this type of quarantine period happened in the 1960s with the smallpox epidemic. For those of you who don't know, we've eradicated smallpox thanks to vaccinations, which is why I'm very pro-vaccinations. Obviously not for just that reason, but it's an important thing to know. 
Something else the CDC is doing is it's working in partnership with the FDA to accelerate the approval process for the testing that's happening for the coronavirus, which at this time can only be done at CDC headquarters in Atlanta. The whole process really takes anywhere from 24 to 36 hours, which is quite a long time. Hopefully they're able to accelerate this approval process and get that process down to somewhere like four to six hours and get the test spread outside of just the CDC lab. That's the goal. It's a lot easier to test it in a regional hospital hospital sites than having to ship the test to CDC every single time. You may have seen some headlines that call this coronavirus outbreak an epidemic. Those headlines are correct. Some have said that it's gonna be a pandemic. You might be wondering what's the difference? Well, an epidemic is a spike in cases in a given area. A pandemic is a worldwide spread affecting many countries with large numbers of people infected. It has not yet been ruled to be a pandemic by the World Health Organization or pretty much any health organization. That being said, it's very possible that it may turn into a pandemic. But again, these are just definitions. They don't really mean anything for you and I on day-to-day -day terms. In fact, what I take away from the possibility of this becoming a pandemic, and I certainly hope that it doesn't continue to spread, is that the countries that are gonna be affected most by this, disproportionately, are those that are the low socioeconomic countries, ones that don't have a modern healthcare system. You think about certain countries in Africa, India, where there's high rates of poverty, you're gonna have individuals that are gonna be dying from this simply because they don't have access to supportive care. You may remember that in the previous video that I did on this virus, I said that there is no treatment. Well, while there's no treatment, we can definitely give supportive care. Just recently, the NIH director came out and said about 20% of these cases require intensive care monitoring. This is usually in the form of mechanical ventilation. And if you live in an area where that's not available, it's very possible that one in five people will continue losing their lives. And certainly low GDP countries will not be able to build a thousand bed hospital in the center of a city in 10 days like they just did in China. In fact, I believe that center did just open today and its sole purpose is to help those who are suffering with the coronavirus. Now let's move on to things that we've learned about this virus that we didn't know from the first video. Again, this is a lower respiratory tract type of virus that your body really needs to fend off on its own. The primary symptoms are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. If you're experiencing those and you've recently visited China or you have some relatives or friends that have visited China, you should right away call your health provider, let them know that you're coming with these symptoms so they can prepare the waiting area area so as to not get any extra people sick, especially those with compromised immune systems. New things that we've learned. First, you may remember that I mentioned something about asymptomatic spread of this virus, and it was something that we were really concerned. Let me explain that a bit further. Those who are infected with the virus but are not showing symptoms, meaning that they don't have a fever, cough, or shortness of breath, they can technically spread the virus. We found out this to be true. Now, the cases where they have spread the virus, the, these asymptomatic individuals, the cases have been rather mild. Also, when we look back at the history of past pandemics, the main drivers of these viruses have been those who have been ill. In fact, this virus is quite similar in the way that it spreads and the way that it gets people sick to our current influenza virus. And I bring that up specifically to put things into perspective. There's so many people that are worried about the coronavirus here in the United States. There's 11 people with it zero people have died. Just this flu season, there have been more than 19 million cases of the influenza virus. There have been over 180,000 hospitalizations and over 10,000 deaths. The influenza virus is what is a serious threat to our health. And I see many patients that have not yet gotten their flu shot. Get your flu shot because the influenza virus is a real threat and it's imminent and it's here now. We're gonna talk about how coronavirus is gonna evolve and what can happen, next steps, but right now you can protect yourself against influenza by getting vaccinated. I'll be saying the same thing if we do create a vaccine in time for the coronavirus as well. And if you're interested in ways you can stay safe, whether you're traveling or not, I gave all those tips in my first video, definitely check that out. Another interesting thing we've learned is that this virus can spread through the digestive tract, meaning the fecal oral route. So countries that have poor sanitation, they could be facing even a bigger challenge. And currently, there is no evidence that the coronavirus, the specific novel coronavirus, can affect your pets. And I say that because there's been a ton of people ordering these face masks for their poor pets, thinking that they're gonna protect them somehow with these masks. No, you're not. And the WHO has been clear that there's been no threat to your pets at home. 
Bear doesn't need a mask. Speaking of face masks, this has been a major unintended consequence of all of this news coverage and hype and misinformation about this virus that people have bought so many of these face masks that they're running out of supply for hospital systems. Look, the reason we need these surgical masks, the inexpensive ones that go around the mouth and wrap around the ears, is because if someone is sick with the coronavirus, influenza, common cold, it's good for patients to wear them so that they don't get us sick. It's meant for those who are sick to not transmit, not for you to stay safe. There's no recommendation from any organization that you at home need one of these masks. Leave it to the professionals. And I've seen some absolutely crazy Instagram posts of certain influencers posing with some of these masks, showing how stylish they are. This is medical equipment. The fact that we're having shortages of it puts medical professionals at risk, and that's absolutely crazy to me. I wanna share a quick story of something my patient told me just a couple of days ago that has me concerned. So my patient, who happens to be of Asian descent, told me that a couple of days ago, because they take the bus in every day from New Jersey to New York for work, people stopped sitting next to them because they're worried about this coronavirus because it comes from China. And that's just really disappointing. That type of xenophobia doesn't belong here in the US. We're better than that. There's only 11 cases here in the US, none in the New York, New Jersey area. And forgetting that, we should not be xenophobic. We should not be racist. We should not be labeling anyone. That's never ideal. Look, you know I don't stand for that. And I hope that we can all do better. Finally, I wanna give a huge shout out to all the doctors, health professionals, first responders that are working on combating this novel coronavirus out there. There's actually groups of researchers traveling from the WHO to Wuhan, China to help fight this, to learn more about it, and we have to give them a huge thank you. In fact, just the other day, we lost the first doctor to this novel coronavirus in Wuhan, China, and that's always unfortunate. We as healthcare providers put our lives on the line every time something like this happens. I think that's really important to say. Finally, stay alert not anxious. Don't allow these media entities that put scary headlines out there to make you panic. If you want quality information, visit the CDC, WHO, NIH websites, or tune in and check out my videos. I'm gonna be delivering messages from those sources and giving you the most up-to-date information. Remember, this video filmed February 3rd, 2020. If you wanna see my first video on the coronavirus, click here, and as always, stay happy and healthy.